All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the second day, Monday, of December in the year of our Lord, 2024. Hmm. Can we please just reset the election and go back and let them choose, choose some different candidates? I don't know. Uh, the kingdom of Christ, as Jesus said, my kingdom does not come out of this world. It literally does not proceed from this world. Uh, cosmos. It, in other words, his kingdom is from heaven. It's not from the earth. So uh, politics have nothing to do with Jesus. Jesus has nothing to do with politics. Although we have plenty of crazies out there that call themselves things like Christian nationalists who really want to turn the world back into what the Roman Catholic thing did. Uh, or the, uh, the Constantinian thing did. Uh, state Christianity, which is not Christianity at all, because Christianity is from above, not from beneath. It's not of this world. You should understand that. Jesus said that. He said that to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. After Pilate asked him, are you a king? Yeah, you've rightly said that. Why did you ask? Yeah. And then he said, don't you realize that I have the authority to put you to death or release you? And she just said, you'd have no authority at all unless it was given to you by God. Now, Jesus had a mission, and his mission was to die on that cross. That's the, that's the main reason he came. So what I want to talk about today is what evangelicalism really is or is supposed to be. Because I can't find it anymore. I can remember when it still existed in the United States. I'm not sure it exists anymore. Uh, I'm not sure how much existed then either. But uh, having come out of the Holy Spirit's movement in the uh, late 70s and early, or late 60s and early 70s called the Jesus Revolution or the Jesus Freaks or whatever you want to call it. And I was not part of the, the uh, South, uh, Southern California thingy at all. Uh, there were lots of people. There were lots of people. And I, I haven't seen that movie, but since I lived through those times, I probably have a better idea of what it was than they have. Uh, it was not localized. It was global. It was going on in Europe, too. The Holy Spirit was calling young people that were, at that time, dissatisfied with the world, with their lives. We had everything. We had prosperity. We had liberty. Our parents grew up in the Depression and then lived through World War II, usually as teenagers. And then after the war, uh, especially in the United States, the United States emerged almost unscathed, unlike everybody else, uh, in Europe and uh, in Russia, of course, they got the worst pounding of all. Uh, but, uh, well, I shouldn't say that as far as numerically. Uh, they took the brunt of the thing. Uh, but uh, 40 million dead, that's pretty high casualties. Uh, as normal, most of them, or majority of them, were civilians. Typical in war. But... Uh, uh, we came out and uh, growing up with everything, I mean, uh, my family was not wealthy, but my dad was a professional. Uh, we had lots of kids. I was the oldest. And, well, having a car, you know, or two cars, and uh, uh, things were a little tight at times, but uh, 
My dad always ha tried to have us in a new house. Uh, sometimes we lived in an old house temporarily while if he re relocated and well, he found a suitable piece of property outside of town. He didn't want us living in the city. Uh, good man. Good man. I, when I think back over at what my dad did, the things I did not understand or appreciate at the time, I think, yeah, that was pretty good. Uh, country is, life is always better than city, so you're not around all the, the evil that goes on. Cities are concentrations of evil. They've always been historically bad places. And disease. And violence, all, all the, all the, the more people you get in one place, the worse it is. But nevertheless, uh, we were dissatisfied, uh, began, because, and many of us, like I, uh, grew up in church, going to church every Sunday, uh, not Roman Catholic, so it was better than that, but it was Lutheran. Uh, we, we didn't talk about Christians, we talked about Lutherans, Catholics, and, uh, not too much about anything else. Uh, but it was, uh, it was uh, sacramentalism. It was uh, dead Christianity. It was spiritually dead. It was uh, uh, people, not that they didn't have any faith, but it was not what we call, would call evangelicalism. It was not a, people did not, it seemed Christ was not the center of their lives. Let me put it that way. Christ, uh, religion was something you did on Sunday mornings, and you tried to live a moral life. My dad was a, a Boy Scout. He went through all the way through Eagle Scout, and that was, uh, you know, it's not bad, uh, but it's not it's not the same as as knowing Jesus Christ. I mean, God is the unknown God. That's what I grew up, the idea I, I grew up with was uh, helped by a, an uncle that wasn't that much older than me, that God lives behind the curtain at the front of the, uh, at the uh, behind the altar uh, in a Lutheran church. There's usually a cross there and a curtain that represents, I assume represents the curtain in the temple. Yeah, but the thing is, when you're born again, that curtain is ripped from top to bottom, <laughs> and you know the one that's behind it. Not that God is actually behind it, but uh, he, my uncle, I was uh, pretty young, and, and he just loved to do things to me. Uh, like tell me to, he'd charge up a capacitor and ask me to grab it, or he had a hand crank generator and say, here, hold these wires. And just, he was a sadist sometimes. Nevertheless, <laughs> he, was, he was fun. He just had to watch out. But uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, my family was not, uh, you know, reprobates or anything like that. They all believed in God, but uh, my grandparents, for whatever their faults, faults, alcohol sometimes was deeply involved, but that's Lutheran tradition. Yeah, there's there's no, uh, no uh, not like Baptists with their silly uh, teetotalism, which has nothing to do with Scripture. They, they see Jesus could never be a member of most Baptist churches because they have a church covenant that says thou shalt not drink or sell alcohol. Often, often, especially coming out of the 1800s. I saw a visitor of Baptist, Baptist church the other day. Been around since I think 1853. Uh, established the you know, little towns along here are all established by the railroads. Uh, so when the railroad went through, all these po uh, towns popped up every few miles, and uh, they had the church covenant was pasted in the front of the hymnal, I think, uh, on very yellowed paper, and uh, it said something like that: "As I, I will not uh, sell or or consume alcoholic or intoxicating beverages or something like that." That tells you where they came from. Uh, I'm sure most people in the church ignored that. But it would if if you had to if you had to agree to that covenant to be a member of the church, who's excluded? Jesus. He turned eighty gallons of water into good intoxicating wine. It was not grape juice. It was, you know, the the, the term in the King James: after men have well drunk, it means after they're enough to get a little bit tipsy, then you bring out the worse the 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 poorer wine. They won't notice anymore. 
But you have to have some experience with the subject to understand that. Oh, yeah, I had some experience with that. Young people, they'll do anything. Just What's it like to get blasted? <laughs> well, the first time should have been enough, to, but no. Anyway, uh, enough of that. So evangelicalism, uh, what is it? What is it supposed to be? Uh, what was the evangelicalism that I knew that was part of the, uh, the Jesus revolution, which wasn't that revolutionary? It's just that it came, it was dissatisfied people, dissatisfied with materialism, which is good. Materialism is, is anti-Christianity. Capitalism is militantly satanic because it is the glorification of greed. Uh, that's what capitalism is. It's, it's, not, it's not simply buying and selling uh, to, to earn a living. It is greedy for gain. More and more and more. And that, that's what capitalism really is. More land, more property, uh, more slaves, whatever. And it is, it gives no, it's all out of, it comes out of the fall and uh, the self-centeredness of human beings. It's a, one of the products of that. Uh, so it is, it is, uh, it is not God's system. People that tell you that, I don't care what they are, they don't know what they're talking about. They've never read the Old Testament because when God set up his system under the law, there were strict limits on how much of uh, what what uh, uh, Marx would have called called the means of production. In other words, in that time, it's agricultural land. You could not permanently buy land. It was allocated by God to families, and you could only lease it out for a maximum of seven years if you were driven to necessity. But uh, and then after every seven years, it went back to the original person who was a people that was allocated to. Now, in, in cities, you could buy, uh, own property and own it permanently. Well, until you died. There's, there's always an expiration date on it, isn't there? Because it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to God. And the fact that you die to, uh, and can't take it with you generally proves that. So I want to look at what evangelicalism uh, is and what it, uh, what we should think about this and how to tell the real from the vast counterfeits that are out there. That uh, what happened to the Jesus revolution is capitalism. The, the capitalist vultures, uh, the music industry in particular, uh, swooped in and said, hey, this is popular with the young people. We, we can make money on this. And one of the only ones that resisted it was a, a young man my age, uh, Keith Green, some of you may remember him. Uh, he died quite young, uh, plane crash. He got a little overconfident, and he had a private uh, single-engine plane. Overloaded the thing. <laughs> Perhaps uh, testing God's laws of physics, and uh, he died, and his uh, one, one of his children died with him. Uh, but uh, he had uh, a lot of the people that he was... Sort of a teacher, he had a ministry called uh, Last Days Ministries, I believe it was called. A widely cir circulated newsletter, tracks. He was a musician. He would give away his albums at uh, concerts. Although he had to find, he eventually realized he had to limit it to one per attendee. Because uh, people uh, uh, would just grab armfuls. Hmm. Live and learn. Uh, but uh, it, it, originally he was very much uh, holiness, uh, influenced by Finney and some other radicals, particularly by Finney, who did not have a gospel. Finney was, uh, did not know what the gospel was. Uh, but gradually he, he came and one of his greatest songs was near the end of his life. He, he wrote a song called The Grace in Which I Stand. So if you listen to, to Keith Green, 
Uh, remember that progression. He starts very much hardline holiness, uh, do this, do this, do this, and uh, um, but but as the whole movement was experimenting with uh, with communal living, and it was like the Anabaptists in many ways. And then gradually they progressed into uh, as they matured and understood that they were not perfectly holy. <laughs> Uh, and there'd never be, because I began to recognize and understand the scriptures deeper. But it was a product of scriptures in many ways, but it was the Holy Spirit. And, and he was coming into a, a, an understanding of, of grace. I thank God for that. Uh, but so, again, you've got to keep that in the perspective. That where he ended, not where he began necessarily. Uh, a lot of us have matured. I just matured longer than he did. So again, we're, we're I think we're almost. Uh, uh, he'd be this basically the same age as me. I think within a year or two. Anyway, back to this. That's related. I, I see they have that movie out there. But I don't even want to see it because it's not going to be true. Nothing that comes out of out of studios is represents a real thing. Uh, you can't. You can't represent it. You can't photograph it. I, I'm pretty much become a bummer on photography uh, because I cannot capture what I see. I can't. Cameras won't do it because it's more than simply material. It's more than physics. It is spiritual too. Uh, the the beauty you know, the saying beauty is in the eye of the of the beholder. Yeah, I see more than the camera can see. So let's go uh, here. Um, this is uh, a book that happens to be on my shelf. That's useful. Dictionary of Christianity in America. I don't know if it's still for sale. It was published by Inner Varsity Press, which I don't know what they call that now. They changed to some woke term a few years ago. It used to be a uh, uh, Inner Varsity Fellowship was a, uh, a Christian ministry among uh, college students, uh, outreach on the universities. Uh, I think the center of it, yeah, Downers Grove, Illinois. Uh, I think Champaign, Illinois, which is uh, less than 30 miles from here, was the center of that, or Urbana, it might have been. They're sort of like Twin Cities. But this is uh, copyright 1990. Um University Christian Fellowship, now they've renamed themselves some stupid term, rebranded themselves just like just like every church in the city seems like. The, the, the Assemblies of God are rebrand themselves. What is it? The, the largest assembly God in, in Danville, Illinois, now calls himself Hope Unlimited. It's like, really? Um, uh, Another uh, uh, Nazarene church, a little country Nazarene church. I used to be friends with the pastor out there uh, years ago. Uh, I knew him quite well. In fact, I was preaching in the church that he was, he's probably spent more time as a Phil pastor than any pastor ever stayed there as a church in uh, uh, Bismarck, Illinois, north of here. Uh, he, uh, anyway, the church that he built out there, that's uh, oh, two miles from here, I suppose. Uh, they renamed it. It used to be West, let's see, what was it? Uh, Cedar Grove Nazarene. Now it's Hope Church. And because I'm well aware of what Nazarene doctrine typically is, although you can believe the real gospel and still be a Nazarene, uh, I've heard there's actually Calvinist Nazarenes. It's like a Reformed Nazarene. It's like, okay. I'm not sure that works uh, because Calvinists don't believe in the same God that the Bible teaches. So. Uh, I, I thought they say, no, Calvin didn't believe in the same God. And Calvinism, a formal Calvinism, doesn't believe in the same God. Calvinists can. It's just a contradiction, that's all. We all have those. But... Uh, uh, they named, renamed their church Hope Church. It seemed to be very popular around here, Hope. And I was, saw that sign there again. Every time I go by, I'm thinking, yeah, that's an appropriate name because Nazarenes hope they'll get to heaven, typically. The pastor at the church I was attending over here for a year, 
because I couldn't find anything else, I was sick and tired of the Baptists. And uh, uh, the Lutherans were so sectarian, unless you're ELCA. And, no way, Jose. I ain't going there. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, the conservative Lutherans do believe in the scriptures. They do believe in the gospel. It's just that they think they're the only one. <laughs> they even confess they're not the only ones. But if you will not, if the Lord's table is not the Lord's table, but you control access to it, contrary to what the scripture plainly teaches. See, the problem with, uh, with, with uh, confessional churches in general is the confession is the standard, not Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So a person belongs to Jesus Christ. In other, in other words, they don't have a an infamous lifestyle that demonstrates that they're not saved. If they confess Christ. If they say, they, I love Christ. I belong to Christ. Uh, uh, and there's their basic, uh, you know, you, you can ask them their basic doctrines or whatever you want, but as long as it's within the biblical range. So... <sighs> They say, I'm born again. The Holy Spirit dwells in me. You can't turn them away. It's not within your authority. The table belongs to the Lord. So what happens then is you become a church that's not his church because your standards are not Christ's standards. And that's, there's many, many churches like that. Closed communion is an abomination in the sight of the Lord because it doesn't conform to his standards. And that's what happens with confessionalism. It is the confession that becomes the standard instead of scriptures, instead of Christ. So let's take a, I'm going to read a little bit from this volume here on the subject of evangelicalism, just a, the first paragraph and then a second section here. It's got quite a few pages on it. Uh, the movement in North America Christianity, that so this is, Christianity in America, North America, really, United States, essentially, that emphasizes the classical Protestant doctrines of salvation. Eh, well, uh, not the doctrines of grace, which is something else. Uh, a Calvinist called their gospel, which is not gospel. The, the five points of Calvin are called, or five points of Calvinism, that was the product of the Synod of Dort are called the doctrines of grace when Calvinists don't know anything of grace. They don't know anything of grace. They just use that term because it fools people. Uh, again, Calvinists can be Christians, but Calvinism is not Christian. Many people can be deceived and still be Christian. Uh, but in the American context, it is characterized by a stress on personal experience, on a personal experience of, of the grace of God, usually termed the new birth or conversion. Uh, yes, but uh, one of the problems with evangelicalism, it is not defined sufficiently. Uh, the new birth is becoming uh, uh, part of the new covenant. Entering into the New Covenant, which is defined in the Old Testament and the New. The New Testament definition actually goes back to the Old Testament. So it was promised in the prophets that God would bring a new covenant. And that covenant is about a God, God's work in us. So in that sense, it is like Calvinism. It is God saves. He does the work in us. It's his, him that accomplishes it. It's not our work. We are his workmanship. Ship. Uh, not our own, but that doesn't mean we can't say no to God. That's where I really differ with them. Um, interestingly, Arminianism is simply uh, Reformed Calvinism. <laughs> case, all of those dangerous Arminians out there, if you actually read what the Arminians, uh, the Remonstrants, uh, were saying, when they wanted uh, Calvinist, the Calvinist Confession in Holland be revised, it was just, please make it more biblical <laughs> instead of all this Arist Aristotelian stuff. Yeah. So uh, the American context, it, it's characterized by a stress on perso uh, a personal experience of the grace of God. In other words, 
God has saved you. Not a personal experience or a so-called personal experience of grace. No, the grace of God is powerful. It is Christ in you. It's, it is uh, uh, giving you a new heart and a new spirit. It is God putting his own spirit in you, forgiving you all your sins, of course. And, and uh, uh, you, you enter into a, a relationship of knowing God. You truly become a child of God. And you know your Father. And you know Jesus Christ. And you know that Jesus died for your sins past, present, and future. Because it depends on him. Not you. That's where people like Wesley and Finney went wrong. So they're not really... Finney is not an evangelical. Because his gospel is not the gospel. It's Wesley, which was... He flip-flopped all the time. But Wesley... Uh, on his bad days, well, he confessed he was never a Christian because uh, he believed in uh, uh, sinless perfectionism, even if his definition of sin was very loose. You can't do it. He, Wesley was not a, he was a highly flawed individual. We all are. And if, if you think it depends on your works, that you have to stand in your own righteousness, as Wesley and some of his followers Confessed at times. He was widely criticized for that, too. Uh, you're toast. You're not trusting in Christ. So evangelicalism... See, Arminianism says that, too. You, you have to go back and look what the Remonstrance actually said. The five points of the Remonstrance and the five points of Calvinism was answer to that historically. History does matter. Uh, if we don't know where we came from, we don't know why we're, we are where we are. So is the uh, usually term the new birth or conversion. In other words, somebody had a life, something that changed somebody's life happened, and it was the grace of God through faith in Christ. A life-changing experience, not just a momentary prayer or an instant of faith or something like that. A, a, a birth into a continuing relationship with God through faith in Christ. And because of all the pollution and the ignorance and people that were not converted thinking they were, well, this is what always happens to the church. Estimates of evangelical strength in the U.S. and Canada run as high as 50 million. Well, this is 1990, so making it one of the major expressions of Christianity in North America. Evangelicalism is the only expression of Christianity, period. So let's go, I want to turn over, so it talks about, it goes on, talks about the Protestant Reformation, um, which is, Luther called his preachers evangelicals. Okay, let me go back. The word evangelical comes from the Greek, uh, euan and it is a technical term. It, it, it means good news, but it, is, it has a technical use as being the proclamation. So you often, sometimes you hear the, the word the evangel, which has to do with the proclamation of the good news. The proclamation of the, of the good news of victory. So in the ancient Greek world, uh, if, if, a, uh, if your nation defeated another nation, uh, a messenger would come running back to proclaim the good news of victory over the enemy. And in the scriptures, it's used in that way, too, because it is the good news of the victory of God in Christ over Satan, over sin, and over death. It's not just good news, like my sports team won. No, it's good news of God's victory. His final victory was accomplished in Christ on the cross. That hasn't fully unwrapped yet, but it will. We will. That wrap, we're just opening the gift. We will find out what it really is. But that's uh, so. Here it talks about the uh, 
uh, you know, you had the Reformers versus the Roman Catholic Church, and they were, it was like Luther, the, the, uh, the, the importance of God's grace and salvation by grace through faith. Yes. So they had the details of the gospel, but understanding the effect in a person's life, it was, it, sometimes it was just an empty doctrine, often an empty doctrine. So here it says uh, in, uh, under the paragraph on, on page 414, uh, the evangelical revivals during the 17th century, the, the vigorous defense of the gospel in the Protestant Reformation was replaced by an unyielding spirit, so the 17th century, you're talking the 1600s, of Protestant orthodoxy. In other words, it became scholastic. It was technical, dogmatic accuracy rather than a living uh, experience of God in you. Calvinists argued, yeah, there they are again. Calvinists argued about God's eternal decrees, or actually it's decree, singular. And Lutherans about the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Yeah, that sets a problem down here with the, the uh, 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 Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, the denomination, that you have to have their particular view which is not exactly understandable by anyone. It is, it is the denial of the Catholic view while affirming the Catholic view. Huh. It, is, it is somehow Christ is literally present in the bread and the wine, and, and by ingesting him, you receive God's grace. They just don't say that the wine is literally turned into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. No, it's, it's a little bit slightly loosened, but not sufficiently loosened. So if you don't hold the, the confessional view of Lutheranism that nobody could possibly explain to you, because as I told the pastor there, that means uh, this is all Aristotelian nonsense. He knew exactly what I was saying. And he knew my, my point, too. He understood. Say, I, I, I told him, I understand you're part of a denomination and you have to uphold the standard. But you know this is garbage. You know there's Christians out there that they're Christians, but they don't have to believe this stuff. So how can you how can you restrict the Lord's table to, to people that, 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 that believe in Jesus, but don't don't hold to this confessional Lutheran stuff that was made up by men? Well, that's the problem. <laughs> I hate denominations. I don't mean that I hate the people that are there. It's just that's an error. Yeah, that's the 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 the, uh, the doctrinal precision was killing Lutheranism. Throughout Northern Europe, Protestantism was legal, acceptable, and orthodox, and generally lifeless. Yes, and so it is today. So it is today. Southern Baptists, generally lifeless, generally social. social the social, a social thing rather than a, a living relationship with Christ, with God in Christ. Justification by faith was a doctrine to debate more than a life to experience. Absolutely true. We have people out there like James White, who loves to debate doctrines, but I see no evidence he actually is born again. Because, as Jesus said, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. And James White, for example, of Alpha and Omega Ministries, speaks a lot. But seldom does he talk about Christ and what Christ has done in his life. He talks about all kinds of other things that he's doing in his life. He used to spend 15 minutes talking about his biking every day, every time he was on the air. Now it's about his travels in his travel trailer. He goes around debating issues, but not proclaiming Christ. Christ is not the center. 
I mean, it doesn't mean the doctrines have no place, but they better be the faith delivered once for all unto the saints, which is all about a living relationship with God and Christ. Okay, so then it goes on here, and he starts talking about uh, it, the uh, the evangelical uh, revivals began in with the Lutherans with Pietism, what became to be called Pietism, which is a term that's roundly uh, uh, hated on YouTube today by in certain quarters, the Calvinist con converts. They hate it because it testifies against them. See, they don't have, they have doctrine up to here. They probably have a degree in divinity or something, you know. They have theology and their lives are all about theology. And I'm thinking about a young uh, Lutheran minister too that, that over the years, probably the last more than 10 years, I, on YouTube, YouTube's been around for a while now, I, I watched him grow from a, a college student playing around with Lutheran uh, rosary beads and yo-yos. It's like, really? I didn't even know Lutherans had a rosary. I never heard of such a thing. Uh, Lutheran, uh, Conservative Lutherans are a bit different. He's not Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, but I think they're in fellowship with it. Uh, there are more conservatives. Uh, the Lutheran Church... Uh, Wisconsin Senate, they're in fellowship with no one. No one over some petty detail. So you can tell these people, if, if they split off over pettiness uh, of their particular weird doctrine, the pettiness, uh, that they're not even allowed to pray with others. They're that petty. Other Lutherans, other conservative Lutherans, they can't even pray with them because for, for fear that they are they are somehow endorsing that you know they're they're they are so removed. See that that you're so caught up in theology and the, the, theological precisionism that you've forgotten Jesus Christ, probably because you don't belong to Him. People that are like that uh, almost certainly aren't born again. And I can say that because God won't let you get away with that. You can get into error. You can get sidetracked. But God will bring you back. You're not good. It's because it doesn't depend on you. It depends on him. Yeah, you can, you can, you can, you can decide, I, I hate God. I'm not going to follow God anymore. You can divorce God. You can do it. But it's not easy. It's not easy. Once you belong to him, you're his. He's just like a, he disciplines every child he receives. If you're without God's discipline, uh, you're, uh, uh, you're illegitimate. There was an old, the, the, the King James uses the old term for that. The old term for an illegitimate child was a bastard. In other words, it wasn't the product of a legitimate union. Outside of wedlock, and that's what it is. It wasn't, it wasn't produced by Jesus Christ. So it's, uh, uh, what happened was though you, you had uh, pietism, uh, what they came, came to call pietism. And it was start, uh, began with, uh, let's, what do they say here? They say, uh, uh, Jacob, Philip and Jacob Spenner. Uh, and Frankie, Frankie, uh, in Germany, that he he began a system of of works of, of orphanages, so it was uh, it was living it was a return to a living expression of Christianity, and Frankie's uh, outreach to orphans was was famous. It was brought over to England by uh, one of person that came from Germany. I can't think of his name right off the top of my head. But it had to do with the Plymouth Brethren, uh, the Brethren movement in England. And there was an actually division. Uh, you had uh, uh, the guy that started dispensationalism went off one way. He was a uh, quirk. And his opponent in the movement said, no, we're not going to go that way. We're going to follow the scriptures rather than you. So uh, and there were, he that particular individual, who I can't remember his name of, but uh, there's been biographies written of him. He he uh, did uh, a, a number of very large uh, uh, 
orphans ministries in England uh, entirely by faith. In other words, he didn't solicit contributions. He just prayed for them. Uh, he, uh, which was, and waited for God to supply the needs. So, uh, but he had a little bit of, <laughs> what, what, what do they say of him? He was not a one to gladly suffer fools. So he probably had a little bit of an attitude too, but still. Uh, so you had the birth of pietism, uh, which is now derided as being emotionalism. The, the people that deride it, the ones I see, are almost always Calvinists, and they are spiritually dead. They are spiritually dead because their words uh, uh, tell me that because they talk about doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. I, I've got concerns about uh, R.C. Sproul because uh, I watched many of his videos and he got me sort of into the Calvinist thing for a while until the Holy Spirit showed me that they are not telling me the whole truth. It's like, I had this thing about commitment to the scriptures and uh, that always uh, tends to destroy false systems. But yeah, uh, there's guys out there, uh, they generally are followers of uh, theology, definitely students of theology, like that Luther, one young Lutheran I was talking about. Uh, he's gone on to, uh, he was a pastor in a church, oh, what, 30, 30 or 40 miles north of here. Uh, I was always tempted to go up and maybe have a talk with him, but uh, didn't. Probably wouldn't listen anyway. But he went off and uh, didn't stay in, as a pastor for very long. He went off into uh, republishing older Lutheran theological material. Just like, just what Lutherans need, more theological material. Theology is dead. There is no life, there is no salvation in theology. No one is saved by theology. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And a little child can exercise faith in Jesus. Jesus said so. Woe to him that causes one of these little ones, these small children, who believe in me to stumble. So you don't have to have, all you have to do is trust in him. Trust that he's the one. He's the savior. It's not, it's not complicated. It may be difficult because our flesh doesn't want to do that, especially as we grow older. We, because we're self-centered. But yeah, for some people it doesn't seem to be, for others, some people it seems to more, have more trouble uh, getting to that point than others. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but so what is evangelicalism? Uh, it is it is about the gospel. It is a focus on the gospel, on conversion, on salvation, on Jesus Christ. So I, I wrote down seven thing or six things that that uh, uh, I would uh, consider defining uh, or uh, words that identify real evangelicalism. Again, it's about the gospel. It's about Christ. He is the gospel. He himself is the grace of God. He is God. Now, these are not necessarily in uh, any kinds of order of priority. <laughs> but I'll say, first of all, it is Bible-centered. Evangelicalism is Bible-centered. Scriptures are the authority for evangelicals, which puts Pentecostals and even more so Charismatics over on the edge. The Assemblies of God is probably the best of the Pentecostal denominations. You've got others that are uh, oneness Pentecostals, United Church of, of uh, United Pentecostal Church, and others. The oneness groups, uh, T.D. Jakes, oneness. Those people are off the board altogether. They're heretics. They are not Christians. I had a group of them coming, uh, looking to establish another UPC church in where my bookstore was in that area. So there's one right down the road over there. You don't need another one around here. And I, they wanted to pray with me. I said, no way, Jose. We don't worship the same God. We don't worship, you know, shoot, we don't worship the same God. I'm not going to pray with you guys. 
repent. <laughs> Their idea of God does not come from Scripture. Again, they're Unitarians. They believe in modalism, that God was the Father, became the Son, and then became the Holy Spirit. So what do you do with the Lord at his baptism? All three are present, right? Or the, uh, uh, the baptismal formula itself. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The one name. I don't know. So Bible-centered. Again, uh, the problem with uh, Pentecostals, again, they come out of, originally out of the Wesleyan movement out of the holiness movement. Assemblies of God, but there's two streams. Uh, when Azusa Street happened in L.A., uh, the, the others were attracted to it. They were living, they were looking, as I was and others, for living Christianity. Not necessarily, I wasn't looking for tongues and things like that, but I was looking for something that was more alive than what I saw in the local Baptist church or in the Lutheran church, which was even deader. I was tired of worship that was mourning all the time. Oh, woe is me. And worship music that was sung uh, at half its normal speed. There was no joy. No power to overcome sin. So I was looking to investigate, and I got literally dragged into it. You know, you got a bunch of people surrounding you and essentially holding you captive, telling you how to pray in tongues. Well, just make whatever sound comes out of your mouth. Okay, I can do that. But what I ended up doing sounded more like language than what they were doing. But I do know for a fact that, you know, I took a, took a course in linguistics at the UW of Madison, uh, that I learned some things about like there, like, wait a minute. Like, how come all the, 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 the language sounds are my native language sounds? That's a question, you know, it's like, that others have pointed, linguists have investigated this and found it not to be a language. These things aren't languages. Whereas in the New Testament, they are always real languages. In fact, the original uh, people at Azusa Street, it used to be their newsletters from the original publications way back when that started. It used to be online. And you could read in there. Maybe they still are. I just couldn't locate them, and I'm not interested in locating them anymore. But they, they talk about originally they thought they were going to send missionaries over to China and the Far East, and they wouldn't have to go to language school or anything like that. That would be good. Uh, the Holy Spirit would just uh, use open your mouth to speak in tongues, and that'd be all there would be to it. They'd, they'd come out, they'd understand it, and they'd, the Holy Spirit would be preaching the gospel through you. Yeah, that'd be that'd be wonderful. <laughs> It'd probably be better what you would co have come out of your mouth. And so they tried that, and they got over there, and they found out, hey, these people can't understand a word we say. Hmm, there's something wrong with our theology. Yeah, there was, because it's not biblical tongues. Not biblical tongues. Not that I've, I've heard of a case where a, uh, a missionary that I did printing for, his daughter went to China on a trip, and she had an experience where she said, the claim was that she spoke in tongues, and that woman there understood everything she said and told her what she said in English. It's possible. The Holy Spirit can do that. The Holy Spirit isn't limited. He doesn't have an expiration date. But is it normal? No, it's not normal. I have never heard somebody speak in tongues in a language I could understand, unless they're speaking in English, which in which term it's usually called prophecy. And from all the prophecies I've heard, I wouldn't give you two bits for one, which is a quarter for modern people. No, it's not worth two bits. Uh, it was always imitation King James, which is a clue that it's not the Holy Spirit anyway. And uh, 
it was uh, about as generic as fortune cookies. The kind of thing it's hard to deny, you know. Uh, well, you shall meet a stranger within the next month. That kind of stuff. The stuff that horoscopes predict and whatever. So, or, you know, Christian, but, you know, it's the kind of stuff that, that anybody could say. It's not, it's not revelation. And the problem is with any, with new revelation, and this is a, the danger with, oh man, I'm talking and talking and talking. Uh, with the charismatic, especially the charismatic, because they, the at least the Pentecostals, were founded in relatively orthodox Christianity, the Holiness Movement. Uh, Wesley had his real problems introducing other authority than the Scriptures, but nevertheless, they're still somewhat grounded in the Scripture. Uh, they're as grounded as the uh, as the Nazarenes are. That they're off in woke world now, but uh, uh, and seeker sensitive, extreme seeker sensitive, which is the denial of the gospel. Uh, see, Rick Warren is a, is a, is absolute false Christian. Uh, he doesn't know. By that I mean he doesn't know what Christianity is. He never did. Just just like the. Uh, the the theological minded people that that don't know Christ, they, they know doctrine, and they 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 trust in they demonstrate what they trust in by what comes out of their mouth. Uh, people that trust in pop psychology, um, it's like uh, what's his name Peterson Jordan Peterson out there that people are claiming to become a Christian. Well, he's vaguely a Christian. He doesn't have a Christian worldview yet. He may be a Christian, a, a brand new baby Christian, but he shouldn't be teaching about it because he doesn't know it. He doesn't know Christ. There's no evidence. To, for him, it's it's like a it's a psychological thing, and he's talking about Jung, Jungian archetypes. Well, see, he's not biblically grounded, so he's not somebody to listen to, unless you're interested in Jungian archetypes and what psychology says about things, which sometimes can describe things accurately, but like science, they can describe the, the evidence, the facts, but it's the interpretation of the evidence where the problem comes in. Psychology is atheistic. It was founded by atheists, every single one of them. Freud, Jung, Maslow, Rogers, whatever. They were all atheists. So why do you go to the world to deal with problems like sin? What problem isn't related to sin? So Bible-centered. Evangelicalism is Bible-centered, just like the better part of the Reformation. What began the Reformation? The, the availability of Scripture. Luther's greatest contribution was translating the Bible into, in the Greek, into German. Tyndale translated the Bible into English. He was far more responsible for any kind of biblical Christianity in England than Henry VIII ever imagined. Henry VIII didn't want biblical Christianity. He wanted a new wife. What happened to Tyndale? England burned him at the stake for the crime of translating the Bible into English. So people could read the Bible. He is one of the true heroes of the Reformation. Far more so than a Calvin is a death knell in some ways. Calvin contributed nothing good. Whereas Tyndale, the scriptures, see, Calvin amplified the pagan elements that had come into Christianity, the uh, the the right the the, uh, the ideas of God that go back to Plato and especially to Aristotle, that were transmitted into the church uh, in a large part through Augustine. Augustine was awful in many ways. 
Just because somebody's right on a few things doesn't mean you should listen to them. They're the dangerous ones, the ones that are, are right on a few things but wrong on many things. So it's Bible-centered. We don't hold to any, uh, an evangelical does not hold to modern prophets or uh, uh, messages in tongues. We hold to the faith delivered once for all unto the saints, as we're told to contend for that. Not against all the false teachers. You can't do that. They're like whack-a-mole. No matter how many you hit, they'll new ones will be constantly popping up in more abundance. You know, it's it's, it's like going out and, and trying to, to chop down your dandelions. You just spread the seeds. Satan's got more people that he can put in those positions than you can possibly eliminate. So the, the, the thing you need to do is profess the true faith. Instead of, you know, there's, there's all kinds of people. I, I know how to get a, a video viewed. I can go after John MacArthur, which I have serious concerns about. I can go after who else? Uh, uh, Billy Graham. I have really serious concerns about him. I'm not the only one. Uh, false gospel. Uh, universalist, essentially a universalist. Or universally, if you're a good, you're going to heaven. You can be a Hindu, not believe in Jesus. Or a Muslim, not believe in Jesus, and you're going to go to heaven if you're good. Billy Graham, I heard that when I was preaching in, in uh, Bismarck. I called the ministry. I think it was Bismarck, or it might have been Texas. I called the Billy Graham Evangelical Association. I heard Billy Graham said this. He said that to uh, Robert Schuller, uh, Crystal Cathedral infamy out there. And uh, he confessed it. Yeah. Yeah, I believe there's a wideness in God's mercy. You know, that you don't have to actually believe in Jesus. Well, that's not what Jesus said. And I called him up. Did, did Billy Graham, is this is Billy Graham's actual doctrine? Is this, or did he just have a brain fart? And they said, yeah, this has always been his doctrine. Okay. Now I know. I know what to tell my congregation. Don't listen to Billy Graham. Just because somebody's famous, you know, I don't care. I care more about God's people. Who else? Oh, uh, uh, John MacArthur. I have serious questions about John MacArthur. Not that he's preached a false gospel, although it's definitely on the edge uh, when he talks about uh, slaves. We're slaves. Well, MacArthur's got some problems. Uh, one of the things you find out, this has to do with uh, Billy Graham, too, especially with a preacher. Now, people can have be converted without having a dramatic conversion. But at some point, the Holy Spirit has to convict you of your sin, of God's righteousness, and of judgment. There's some place in there, the Holy Spirit. Even, even uh, like the Wesleyans, they talk about God's prevenient grace, the, the grace that goes before actual conversion. That's what they're talking about. God's work to convert you to Christ, drawing you. Calvinists don't do that. God converts you first, then he convicts you of your sin. <laughs> like, no, they got things backwards. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, but MacArthur, who's gone more and more Calvinistic, uh, you know, but there, there are some things about MacArthur that, that really trouble me. One is, in his biography, there is no mention of his conversion. He has no personal testimony of conversion that I've ever heard. One of his uh, Shepherds Conferences, he, I remember he said, uh, talk, talk, I think it was might have been the one on uh, Strange Fire, um, He said something on a uh, one of their discussions. I believe it, like I, I might have heard it someplace else, but he, I, I did hear him say it. I don't have a spiritual bone in my body. Uh, yeah, that could be the case. Uh, you look at his website and his ministry and his works. Uh, they're all centered on John MacArthur. His books, he didn't write them. 
the testimony coming out of the organization is they were ghostwritten. That's how these celebrities do things. They don't write their own books. You just think about it. How could the guy be the president of uh, pastor of a megachurch, the president of a university, the president of a seminary, uh, and have time to write several books a year? It ain't going to happen. Uh-uh. Not going to happen. It's not that easy to write a book. So there's people out there that will write it for you and... What uh, the word out of the seminary from a long time uh, supervisor of the library, I believe it was, was that the the staff is is actually assigned to write different chapters in the book, and they they probably come from MacArthur's study notes or whatever, or general outline, and then he approves it, and it, his name is put on the cover. They get paid a stipend, and he gets the the, uh, the royalties. <laughs> Is John MacArthur Incorporated, and there's other stories that, as a former pastor, I, I could not believe uh, the the accounts of of abuse that has gone on at that at those schools so far. That uh, and this information is available on the internet, including the the actual letter from the accrediting agency to the schools that said that MacArthur has to step down as president of the schools, or the, he'll lose his accreditation because they describe the atmosphere there as toxic. Accounts of uh, the one particularly uh, grievous one was a, a young lady student that uh, was apparently uh, uh, given lohypnol, lo a date rape drug, in a uh, soft drink, I believe, originally, at a uh, event uh, by a person that she thought was a student, an older student at the school, but wasn't. And uh, it uh, her rape proceeded over a period of days, and she comes back to the school and, and goes in to speak to John MacArthur and ex tell him what happened. And John MacArthur's response was not concerned for her, but to expel her from the school for drinking. Yeah. He was in tr trying to protect his own name and his own school from scandal instead of doing what was right in the sight of God. I mean, this is, this is uh, a pretty well-documented case. And it fits with other things that have, and there, there's been, there's actually a, uh, Oh, what do they call it? Like users groups or things out there, uh, Facebook groups about uh, uh, the students complaining of various experiences at MacArthur schools. So you have a toxic environment. Uh, you don't have, uh, you have uh, theology, but not uh, the presence of the Lord. MacArthur, uh, he's one of these guys that boasts about going verse by verse through the scriptures. But preaching the scriptures is not the same as preaching Christ. It's not the same thing. So evangelicalism is not only Bible-centered, but it's also Christ-centered. It is Jesus. He is the Savior. He's, the Bible points to Jesus. As Jesus said to some of the scribes and Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. In other words, in the book itself, in the scroll itself, that gives you eternal life. But Jesus says, but they speak of me. It is Christ who is our Savior. Our life is in him. Our salvation is in him himself, not in the book that tells us about him. We're saved through knowing Christ, not through knowing the Bible. You don't have to know the Bible to be saved. You simply have to have faith in Christ. Very little knowledge is necessary. If you don't know Christ, you cannot understand the Bible because spiritual things are spiritually understood. Without the author explaining it to you, giving you insight, you won't understand it. Well, you can make a name for yourself like MacArthur does. He reads a scripture, then goes off and sputters a bunch of ideas of his own. Drives me crazy. I'll, look, I'll listen to that. Where did he get that? Where did he get that? I listened to some local pastors. They drive, they drive me crazy. 
to start reading a verse, and then he goes off and talks about this and about that, and he says, this means this and this and this, and I, I, I listen. I got shelves full of books. Where did he get that from? What, some, some volumes of sermon illustrations he bought someplace? They'll make claims about uh, the Greek word means this or that. I heard another Baptist preacher do that the other day. Or was it an Assembly of God preacher? I don't know. What's the difference? And I said, what? No, that was the Assembly of God, some young guy they had there. I went back, and I, I have to, that does, that's wrong. I, that's not right. So I had to go back. I looked it up. I said, where did I get that from? You know, sometimes it's like an alarm bell goes off. I don't even have to, you know, oh, that's not right. I, I just felt there was something wrong. That was not true. And sure enough, it was not true. But, see, bible centered. the Bible's the authority, especially the New Testament. Especially the New Testament, because Christianity is under the New Covenant. We're not under the law of Moses. Moses and the prophets speak of Christ. That's the only purpose of the Old Testament. If we understand the Old Testament through the, the, through the New, that this is what that leads up to. You're not going to be saved in Genesis. You're not going to be saved in Isaiah unless it's pointing you to Christ. Law of Moses condemns you to death, to hell. It doesn't save you. The purpose of that is to show you your need for a Savior, which you find in the New Testament. No one was saved until Christ came. Abraham wasn't saved. That's why Jesus said, He rejoiced to see my day. Why? Because he was in paradise, not in heaven. Just like the rich man was in torments, the other half of paradise. What we commonly call hell. In other words, he was, in, he was until Christ died for our sins on the cross, no one could come to the presence of God. couldn't because you were still in your sin. Atonement had to be made. Faith itself without the cross is nothing. It's not enough. It doesn't remove your sin. The cross does. So it's Bible-centered. We look to the faith delivered once for all unto the saints. If it comes after that, like the Pentecostals and Charismatics have attended all prophets, you can find. Just search for prophet on YouTube. All kinds of people claiming to be doing things. Redding, California, church out there claiming to raise the dead. Prove it. Go, angel, look up angel feathers. Gold from heaven. All kinds of claims. Strange that the gold seems to be actually mylar based rather than gold. Gold dust, look at that. It's not so, so the Holy Spirit creates false gold. Angel fires that look amazingly like the kind of stuff you can buy at Walmart. All the dyed feathers. Why is that? Where does the Bible say angels have feathers? Did you ever look that up? I did. It doesn't mention angel feathers anywhere. They are so gullible. Ah, oh, man. They're not grounded in Scripture, especially the Charismatics, because Charismatics come out of the liberal churches and the Catholics. They never were grounded in Scripture. At least Assemblies of God, the, 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 that kind of Pentecostals, still have grounding in Scripture. And the Assemblies of God are not are Baptistic, they're not uh, Wesleyan, so they, they've got a double advantage there. But the, the movement itself came out of Wesleyanism, a second work of grace, and came out of, well, you can look up the roots for yourself. Uh, so it's Bible-centered, the Bible is our authority, especially the New Testament. Because we live under the New Covenant. New Testament, New Covenant, same thing. The difference between Testament and Covenant is Testament is a will. In other words, a, a, a person's death is what brings it into force. 
so it's more technical name. Uh, but it's uh, so it's Bible centered, but it's Christ centered. You have a person like MacArthur that's Bible centered, but he's not Christ centered. He's not. He's not Christ centered. Look at all his books. I mean, what you'll find in common is they have John MacArthur on the cover. Look at the website, Grace Community Church website. Look at Shepherd's Conferences. Is it really about Jesus Christ? Is it really about salvation? Is it really about being born again? There is no evidence in MacArthur's uh, biography that he was ever born again. He never, there's no testimony of a conversion experience at all. Billy Graham has a testimony of a conversion experience, but it's a little bit dicey. Uh, he had a went to a revival put on by a known racist and member of the Ku Klux Klan. Not that unusual back in those days. Uh, and uh, uh, he went forward sort of on a, a dare with another guy. And then later at night, it's a kit. It's a kit. Later at that night, he said, oh, I think I really do believe. He was like, <laughs> believe what? Were you convicted of your sinfulness? Were you convicted of your need for a savior? Did you, did you give your life to Christ? Did you cast yourself at the foot of the cross and say, God, save me? Unless your salvation came out of conviction of sin, what were you saved from? Was it God's work or man's that brought you to where you are? Question. I'm not saying he's not a Christian or wasn't. I'm just saying, I got a question. I'm not convinced he was. And when he said what he said to Robert Schuller, it's like, at the very least, he doesn't really believe the gospel, which puts him outside. If, if, that, if, if Billy Graham, and this is documented, well documented, he did, this was on television, in a conversation with Schuller, says, saying that, that good people go to heaven. They don't have to know Jesus Christ. They don't have to confess Jesus Christ. Jesus said you do. So who is Billy Graham? Who was he representing? You look at the, all these people. None of them live in poverty either. It's like people that end up in Washington. Where are the poor people that are representing their constituents in Washington, D.C. Where are they? They won't be found. They won't be found, will they? Where are the, where are the people that don't give a dang about money? Where are they found in the Congress, the Senate, or the presidency? They're not found there. Unless they got so much money already. They don't represent the people either. I don't know. I think you've got to be a little bit of a narcissist, maybe more than a little bit of a narcissist and a sociopath to serve in the government and some other things. Police officers sometimes are notorious for the kind of people they attract. Not that they can't be good people, but a lot of people go there for other reasons, just like the pastorate. There's a lot of people, awful lot of people. The majority of people that are pastors are not there because God called them or because they love Christ. Most of them don't know him. They don't know Jesus Christ. They've never been converted. They're professionals. It's a job, a career. You know, Christianity under persecution does much better. Because those people won't do that. If it could get them killed, they don't do it. So it's not in their personal interest. So Bible-centered, Christ-centered, cross-centered. The purpose of Christ's coming, the major purpose of his ministry, was to fulfill the law and die as an innocent sacrifice on that cross for the sins of the world. Not just the elect, the world. I'm referring to Calvinism. They don't believe in the Bible. They believe in their theology. 
Just listen to them. It's all about their theology and their confessions. That's their standard, not the scripture. They don't hold to the faith delivered once for all unto the saints. They don't contend for that. They contend for their theology. People like, again, James White. Just listen to his words. As Jesus said, you will know them by what comes out of their mouth. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. What do people love to talk about? That's what fills their heart. Oh, they can talk about other things. But if you're around somebody that loves baseball, they'll always be wanting to talk about baseball, right? Or they love cars, they love what they're doing. Uh, they, they'll talk about, they want to talk about what they love. They always want to talk about theology, that's what they love. Listen to R.C. Sproul, he loves to talk about theology. His lectures are all, most of them I think were pirated, but they're on YouTube. Yeah, it's all about theology and history. It's not about Christ, other than a theological subject. There's another man. Was he ever converted? You don't have to be because they believe in infant baptism. Presbyterians and Reform believe in infant baptism. No conversion necessary. The water does it. Well, not technically for them, but uh, there, there's controversy there. You got people like Doug Wilson and the, the fringes. Uh, so Bible-centered, Christ-centered, cross-centered. The mission of Christ was to die on that cross. That was his main mission. He didn't come simply to teach. Most of his teaching is about the law uh, because the law convicts people of their sin and shows them the need for a Savior. He came to be the Savior. He came to be the the sacrifice that atones for the sins of the world, the whole world, every person. That's what the scripture really tells us. Don't believe the phony Greek arguments from people that claim to even have taught Greek, because if you research it, you'll find out they're not telling you the truth. They're repeating what they were taught by others, just repeating statements made by others that were not true. Always Try to go back to the source if you can. Pray to God. He'll show you. He will. He'll lead you. The thing that led me out of Calvinism was that. The Holy Spirit just directed my gaze to a thing on the video screen, on the scripture, uh, uh, a lexicon. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like, really? And then I verified that. I verified the lexicon with the scriptures. Huh. My Calvinism evaporated. Yeah, because it was a lie. You know, they, they, they had to come up, the scriptures contradict Cal, Calvinism, so they have to explain away the scriptures. And they'll do that with being a little bit tricky or, or ignorant. And but you think a person that taught Greek, biblical Greek, wouldn't make that mistake. But yeah, they'll do it. They're blinded. You got you got glasses on, colored glasses. You can only see the particular thing the filter lets through. So Bible-centered, Christ-centered, cross-centered, gospel-centered. So it is. It is not only the cross. See. Catholics believe in the cross. They believe that Jesus came to die for the sins of the world on the cross. Where's the problem with Catholics? Not just the Pope. Catholics got a problem with the Pope. He's not a Christian at all. He's a pagan. They've always had pagan popes. Uh, you know, state Christianity, which is, Catholicism comes from state Christianity, comes from Constantinianism. It's not truly state Christianity. It's just that in the West, the state Christianity would let go their own way. The old Rome. And because uh, uh, the Roman Empire broke down in the West, uh, the Pope was left uh, to be the sole authority, basically. So it sort of became the center of government. And you had popes at times even going out, had their own armies, their own land, everything else, their own kingdom. 
but all their claims, all their stuff that comes after everything Rome claims that makes Roman Catholicism what it is, comes after the faith was already delivered. So any addition is false. It is not part of the faith delivered once for all unto the saints. Again, that's why evangelicals are Bible-centered as far as our source of authority, our objective authority. Christ-centered and cross-centered because that's his central mission. And gospel-centered, the good news of salvation, of course, Jesus purchased our salvation on that cross. How do we participate in that? How does it save me? And that's through faith. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ. That is a testimony of the New Testament, uniformly, not of works. Faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So some people say, well, it doesn't say Luther added uh, faith alone. Well, the context implies faith alone. And it's stated elsewhere explicitly by Paul in Ephesians, not of works. We are saved by the grace of God through faith, and that not of yourselves. Not of works. It is the gift of God. Lest anybody boast, God will not tolerate sinners to boast about saving themselves. It's a free gift received by faith. Faith is not a work. Contrary to what some people say, Calvinists in particular. So it's, it's you know, cross-centered. And then, again, Roman Catholicism, as far as that, you know, the, that's not the problem. The problem is how do we receive the grace of God? Is it through the church? Is it through the sacraments? Is it through obedience to a set of rules and principles? Is it about submission to the Pope? You got to be in communion with the Pope to be saved? Of course, nowadays the Pope comes out and he says, everybody's saved, doesn't matter. All religions are equal, doesn't matter. They're all ways to God. The Lutherans were saying that before the Pope was, by the way. The ELCA, I remember a pastor up there doing that, trying to pull a fast one on people. I didn't stay there very long. It's like he, was draw, he was doing a, a series of lectures at, uh, during the weeknight on the road less traveled, which is not a Christian book at all, but somehow became popular because it said what people wanted to say, wanted to hear. Beware of Christian books or pseudo-Christian books. Uh, it's, a, it's a gospel. What is the gospel? Luther had that right. The problem with Luther is it was we're justified by faith. We're not just justified by faith. We're also sanctified by faith. Luther had, a, had the half of the gospel. But Lutherans tend to, it's like the, the Baptist with easy believism. Because I believed, I had a moment of belief, therefore I'm going to heaven. Or I, because I said a sinner's prayer, I'm going to heaven. Or because I got baptized, I'm going to heaven. Well, that's basically what you hear in Lutheran churches. You were baptized, therefore you're regenerate. Bullshit. That's my answer to that. Bullshit. I could raise my hand in court and say, not true. Not true in my life. I know I was a lost sinner. They deceived me, saying I was a Christian, because they had sprinkled me as an infant. It had no effect on my life. But when Christ came in, it changed me. Yeah, I still had sin. But I belonged to him. I knew him. He was not the unknown God behind the curtain anymore. The curtain was ripped from top to bottom. If you don't know what I'm alluding to, go look it up in the Bible, in the New Testament. The curtain in the temple. Yeah, it was no longer the unknown God. That barrier was gone because I was, what's the word, reconciled with God and sanctified unto God by his work. I said, God, save me. And he did. I found God, when you ask him according to his will, he answers your prayer. 
He answers. If you want to be saved, not saved from a problem, but saved from yourself, he will answer you. If you want God to solve a problem in your life, forget it. He's not in that business. I mean, if you're unsaved. God, God will assist you. And, but that's not, he's not, he's, that's not why Christ came. He didn't come to fix your, your arthritis or something. He came to fix your problem of being at enmity with God. To reconcile you to God. And that's through faith in Christ, that alone. So it's faith-centered, too. Evangelicalism is Bible-centered, Christ-centered, cross-centered, gospel-centered, and faith-centered. We're saved by faith alone, not of works, not living by principles. This cuts out a lot of Baptists. Oh, boy. Most Baptists out there are not evangelical. Southern Baptists... Everything is about a program. Rick Warren, you know, he was the big thing in the Southern Baptist for a long time. He had a diet program. He had, uh, had mental health programs. He had all kinds of programs. Evangelism program that wasn't evangelism at all. It's how do you get the unchurched into a church building? That's what he thought evangelism was. And his solution was, Find out what they want and give it to them. That's not seeker sensitive. That's sinner sensitive. He didn't care because he didn't know what salvation was. Like in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, it's one paragraph on salvation. Say this prayer with me. And if you are serious, welcome to the kingdom of God. I'm sorry, that's not the way God works. But that shows you how dead the Southern Baptists are because there was no criticism of that, generally speaking. Rick Warren was a big hero because he had a big church. He was considered a success. But his gospel was non-existent because it could not save you from your sin. It wasn't even about your sin. It was about getting in the building. That isn't salvation. Being a member of a Southern Baptist church does not save anyone. Or a Roman Catholic church. Or any church thing that are really nothing more than religious clubhouses. Conversion centered. You must be born again. Who said that? Evangelicals? Jesus said that. Unless you are born again, you cannot even perceive the kingdom of God. And repeat, unless you're born of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, in chapter 3 of John, in case you don't get the reference, said, well, how do I do this? Do I go crawl back into my mother's womb again to be born again? And what is Jesus going to talk about? The Spirit blows where it wills. The word Spirit and wind are the same word. So it's like the wind, you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going, so is the Spirit of God. He does what he desires. You're not in charge. It is God. God has to blow upon you. He has to blow the life of breath into you, just like God formed Adam from the dust of the earth and then breathed the breath of life into Adam. And Adam became a living soul. So as to God has to breathe his spirit into us that we might become living spirits. Yep. Born again. The promises of the new covenant. A new spirit. A new heart. Forgiven all our sins. Reconciled to God. A heart upon which he writes his wishes, his desires, his commands that we become his children, truly, and know God. And Jesus said to know God is to have eternal life. If you know God, you have eternal life. If you're born again, you should be able to say, I know God, because he has saved me. And it's something that you know, not because some preacher has said it. 
So there's a conversion that takes place. We are converted onto Christ. We are converted out of this world. We are called out of the world and called onto Christ. That is what evangelicalism is about, these things. These are the marks of evangelicalism. It is simply the faith delivered once for all unto the saints. It's about Christ and salvation. If somebody turns it to something else, if you focus your, your attention even on the Bible, or goes on preaching, preaching, preaching about some silliness that's irrelevant to salvation, like uh, the donkey Jesus rode on, or the shape of the cross, or some other nonsense that's irrelevant, or says that Jesus was not sinless. Many so-called Christians believe that Jesus was not sinless. Then they have no Savior. They have no Savior. How can you preach too much on Christ crucified, the atonement for the sin of the world? It's hard to preach on because it's mysterious. It's so high above us. Let me tell you about John Calvin. If you research, look up in Calvin's um, commentaries. You can find him online, I'm sure. Probably in PDF someplace. All that stuff is online somewhere. <laughs> Look up Calvin's comments on John 3.16. If a man, generic, anthropos, female, male, doesn't matter. If someone gets excited about John 3.16, they may be a Christian. They may be saved. If someone just comments it on it technically or in passing, you know they don't know God. They don't, they're not saved. If they can't get excited about God sending his son to die for the sins of this world, that God gave his, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting, eternal life. If they can't get excited about that, it's because they don't possess eternal life. They're still in their sense, almost certainly. That's what evangelicalism is supposed to be about, it's salvation. God bringing salvation to sinful humanity. The shout of victory that is the eungelion, the good news of victory over sin, over death, over the devil, by God's hand and how it's freely offered to all, all who will put their trust in Christ. That is what evangelicalism is all about.